Well, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, welcome to Amplify Surgical's webinar um, covering our, our latest novel spine technology featuring our dual expanding dual X T lift, lateral uh, and dual portal endoscopic technique. Uh, I am joined by three. I'm joined by three very distinguished panelists, uh, starting with Dr. Kaku uh, Barco uh, from North Houston, also Dr. Daniel Park uh, from Southeast Michigan, and also uh, Dr. Don Park from UCLA Health. Um, with that, let me start the meeting with a, a brief overview of Amplify Surgical and our technology, uh, of which Dr. Park. Daniel Park, uh, Don Park, and, and, and Dr. Barco will be covering throughout their uh, case presentations and, and their talks. So Amplify Surgical was founded about five years ago, uh, and we've been commercial uh, for about three years with our uh, rather novel dual expanding inner body cage, addressing a minimally invasive and now a, dual, uh, a very novel dual portal or two portal endoscopic technique. <clears throat> we also have a, a technology that is uh, uh, that is geared for the lateral approach as well from that standpoint. So this video quickly uh, and briefly dis describes and kind of gives you an overview of our technology. So let me start with that. So this is an example of our T-lift expandable cage. Expands horizontally first, and then continues on to expand vertically. It's got a, a unique locking mechanism, providing multiple lordotic options. So technique is, is simple. You insert the way you would normally do for a posterior approach like a TILA. And the starter will do the expansion again horizontally and vertically. Opens up the cage wide for good post packing bone grafting ability. And once you're fully done with that procedure, you follow up and finish off with a final locking screw, providing a, a what we would like to think an A lift like geometry with a posterior approach uh, solution such as dual X. So with that, you know, we love hearing how surgeons mention that it's like performing a lift through the back. Uh, you get images like this, uh, again, providing a, an e lift like geometry or posterior approach. But the lateral system that allows you, it expands in a very similar way, but it has a very unique uh, advantage that comes with this, this mechanism that allows you to, to deliver the lateral cage to a very small portal, which Dr. Daniel Park will be uh, discussing in length. And finally, we have a very novel and new uh, approach uh, to minimally invasive spine, as we like to call a dual portal approach. Uh, and Dr. Don Park uh, will be discussing this in length uh, towards the end of the, um, the webinar. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce and send it over to Dr. Marco to go over MIS TLIP using dual X technologies. Dr. Marco. Thanks, Andy. And uh, thank you to everybody who's tuned in. And thank you to my other panelists as well. It's a pleasure to be on this talk with you guys and talk a little bit about uh, uh, dual, dual X and the expandable uh, te technology that Amplify has. Um, so with that, let's get into it. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, so why Amplify? Um, I have always been an expandable uh, TLF cage user in my practice. Uh, for many reasons, and I've tried a lot of different cages. Uh, these are some examples of, of previous cages I've used in the past, but they all left something wanting. Some of them, uh, you know, you could get some vertical expansion, but once you expanded it, you couldn't backfill it. Some of them were material properties. I prefer titanium cages, and some were either peak or, or hybrid materials. Uh, others would expand in width, but had very uh, limited power to expand in height. Uh, some of them was instrumentation, but uh, 
throughout it all, I tried several different companies. There's always some frustration. And so uh, I told my rep at that point that I was either going to, we were either going to find something new or we we're going to have to design something on our own because nothing was, was, was performing the way I wanted to. Uh, so uh, one evening got into, you know, one of those deep rabbit holes online, looking at different things. And I stumbled across Amplify and Dual X, I believe on Instagram. And, and I, I uh, called Andy up. And we had a great conversation. He sent some samples out. We, we, I, I took a look at it and I said, this has everything that I, that I really want an expandable uh, TLF cage to have. I've been using it ever since. So it's been, been a great experience with it. It's really been a powerful tool uh, uh, for my patients. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of criticisms about expandable cage technology and T-lifts. You know, the big uh, three that you hear a lot about are subsidence, sagittal alignment, and uh, post-expansion grafting. Uh, I think um, Dual X answers a lot of these issues, and, and, and that's why I enjoy using it. So first, when you think about subsidence, we uh, know that, um, if, you, if you go to the next slide for me, Andy, uh, we know that um, you want to engage the apophysal ring as much as you can to get kind of on, uh, engaging that heart or cortical bone um, to minimize those risks of uh, subsidence. And so that's why certain studies have showed that, you know, more banana shaped uh, cages subside less than uh, bullet uh, type cages. And that makes sense to us, you know, biomechanically because you're, you're engaging that uh, apophysal ring, which dual X allows you to do. So it kind of helps from a subsidence standpoint. Sagittal alignment has been uh, an issue that's been debated amongst uh, critics about T lifts. Are we kyphosing people? Are we able, uh, are we, uh, you know, able to restore lordosis um, and segmentally with, with the T-lift. I think, you know, there's uh, a lot of documentation literature on both sides of the argument, but um, when you look at deeper at all these, a lot of it is based on uh, cage placement, right? And if you place the cage more anteriorly, um, cages that have more lordosis, you're able, you are able to restore uh, the segmental lordosis. So um, I think um, with dual X, uh, particularly, and, and as Andy showed, the different uh, types of uh, amounts of lordosis that are built into these cages and the, and the powerful uh, expansion uh, technology, you are able to restore segmental lordosis uh, and help with sagittal alignment overall with this uh, implant. And the third thing is uh, post-expansion grafting. And, and that was one thing that really, really, really bugged me about some of the other technologies out there. It's great if you have an expandable cage, but if you're leaving a huge cavity unfilled with bone graft, uh, that doesn't sit well uh, with me and, and probably a lot of you either. So uh, having an expandable cage that you're able to, to backfill with a significant amount of graft, as Andy showed in, in the video, was really, really important. It's something that's been a powerful tool uh, with this dual X cage. So I uh, want to get into a, to a couple of cases, a couple uh, sample cases uh, that I've had. But before we do that, just want to talk a little bit about my technique um, on an MIST lift. I do a uh, Wiltsy approach. One minor change is I previously was using an 18 millimeter tube. Uh, now I use a 20 millimeter tube. Uh, not that big of a difference uh, from an incisional standpoint. Um, but I think it just allows for a little bit better visibility with the instrumentation with the dual X cage. Um, if you go up to a 20 or 22 millimeter tube um, uh, on your T lift side. Um, one of the things that's really, really important technically if you're going to be using dual X is this is not like two, three passes with the shaver and throw the cage in type of implant. You really, really have to focus on doing a wide discectomy because it, it's, it is a wide expansion, right? You're going from 12 to 21 millimeters. So you have to really clear out and take your time, do due diligence to do a wide discectomy. The other thing that was a little bit of a change for me is um, I do uh, less uh, pre-packing of the disc space now that I'm using dual X and that's because you need that space available to expand the cage. So if you are used to pre-packing with a significant amount of like uh, autograph from your facetectomy, you might run into some challenges trying to get the cage as anterior as you would like to because you just don't have enough space once it's expanded. Uh, and then lastly, um, as a tip for when you start using uh, dual X, um, you want to take appropriate fluoroscopy. So one thing that's different, a lot of times when we're putting in uh, T-lift cages, uh, whether static or expandable, a lot of times we'll do that just under lateral fluoro. 
Um, with dual X, you do need to take AP fluoro shots as well. And I'll show an example of that one of my cases to make sure that uh, you're properly aligned with the disk space before you expand it uh, uh, horizontally uh, to make sure that you're not digging into that in place. So that's a little uh, different workflow that you might be used to, but it only takes a couple extra uh, seconds to do that. But it's really important to make sure that you get the proper alignment of the cage uh, before you expand it. So our first case, uh, this is a 62 year old gentleman uh, who presented uh, with a year of low back pain with progressively worsening neurogenic claudication. He tried all the conservative management uh, that's out there, PT, NSAIDs, injections, but unfortunately wasn't getting lasting relief. Um, and so he came in and these were his uh, imaging images on the next slide. So he had a uh, spondylolisthesis at, at 4.5. You can see some representative MRI uh, images there as well. You can see on the axial cut, he has pretty significant uh, stenosis at that level with the pseudo disc bulge and see a little fluid on his facet joints as well. Um, and so uh, at this point, you know, uh, he'd failed all conservative management, thought it best to decompress him and stabilize it with uh, inner body fusion. And so uh, that's what I did uh, using dual X. So here are some intraoperative fluoroscopy shots. Uh, as you can see there on the left, it's really important to, to take that AP shot. So you can't just expand on the lateral, wanna take an AP and make sure that you're in line with the end plates uh, as you're expanding uh, the, uh, the cage uh, laterally. So uh, you put it in, uh, initially get it into the disc space on the lateral, then I'll, I'll swing it to an AP, uh, do a couple turns to expand it, make sure that my rotation is appropriate with the end plate before uh, finishing its uh, horizontal expansion. And then I switch back to the lateral to make sure that I'm advanced as anteriorly as, as I want to be. Um, and so these are his uh, final shots uh, uh, in the OR. And he's now about a month out doing really well. Um, a resolution of his neurogenic claudication and back pain. Uh, and you know, quickly on his road to recovery uh, to be, to be living a more pain free lifestyle. Yeah, this is in the office. Um, our next case, um, I wanted to present um, my most recent case, just so you know that I didn't just pick uh, the best images. I, I picked the most recent. So this is a patient that uh, is still in the hospital. Just uh, surgery was completed yesterday. Uh, so 72 year old patient, uh, five months of back pain, uh, similar neurogenic claudication, had a little ridiculous pain going into her groin as well, uh, had failed conservative management um, uh, as well. And these are her images. So she uh, has a spondylolisthesis, uh, as you can see on reflection films, and, uh, uh, didn't see the static lateral, but a little bit of motion there at three, four. On our MRI uh, uh, images, you see she has pretty significant stenosis at both two, three, and three, four. She also had some foraminal stenosis at this level. I was think I thought I felt was contributing to to her groin pain as well. So the plan was to decompress her um, widely um, at both of these levels, and in doing so, uh, you know, significantly resect. Uh, uh, significant portion of the facet joints felt I need to stabilize it on the back end. Um, so that's what I did, and it inner bodies uh, to restore some disc height uh, and, and for anterior fusion mesh as well. And so she got the next slide. Oh, that's what she got. So uh, these are her shots. You can see on the left side, um, they're 20 millimeter tube. Um, you can see initially get the uh, the cage in on the lateral, as I showed on the last case, at that point I swing to an AP as I start to do my horizontal expansion, make sure that I'm in line uh, with the disc space um, and then uh, finish up. So she's, as I said, post up day one. So she's still feeling it a little bit from a back pain standpoint, but I think she's gonna do really well. I was able to get you know wide decompression with that, really get great uh, uh, disc height restoration and uh, lordosis segmentally there with, with these uh, implants. And so my third and final case, as um, Andy mentioned, a lot of times you hear uh, uh, folks mention dual X as a mini ALIF. And um, uh, I 
it, you know, a huge fan of ALIFs. I don't think that uh, this technology is meant to replace ALIFs in any way, shape, or form. That's not what we're saying. But there's pros and cons to ALIFs. So the great large implant, you know, direct visualization can really get a full discectomy and decompression. You know, you can use BNP, great sagittal bounce correction. But there are also some cons depending on where you are and where you live, um, if you have great access surgeons or not. Um, uh, whether or not you know they're timely when they show up, um, whether or not they're they're uh, differential to you as 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 it being your case or not, um, there's there's a lot of issues there. And, you know, some, if you're doing a 360, you got to flip the patient. There's time time with that. So uh, I think dual X um, uh, for those who uh, want a similar footprint would be are going to be really happy with that. So this next case. Uh, was a young lady who, uh, who has pretty long history, as you see there. Initially, she, uh, she had a, a, prior to coming to me, she had a microdiscectomy several years ago, unfortunately re-herniated and had a, a revision microdiscectomy. Um, following that, she uh, did well from a radiculopathy standpoint, but started to develop more low back pain um, due to that and ultimately failed conservative management. And after six months, decided uh, to go on uh, to fuse that level, so she had uh, a 360 at that level. She was doing well after that, but unfortunately got in a motor vehicle accident uh, and herniated at the level above at 4.5. Uh, had a couple of uh, microdiscectomies there, um, but uh, after uh, uh, failing that course, um, uh, started to develop a little bit of low back pain and said, you know, look, I just want this fuse. I want to be done with it and get, get on with my life. Um, and so if you, on the next slide are some of her images, um, this, uh, sorry, it doesn't project all that well, but you can see uh, on the far left is after her, her uh, two microdiscectomies at 5.1, she had some disc height collapse, started to have that low back pain, ultimately had a, a fusion at that level, did well till she re-herniated, um, and then started developing more back pain. And so, uh, uh, ultimately uh, ended up with the uh, fusion at, at the four or five level as well, which I think is on the next couple of slides. Yeah, this just shows um, some of the disease pathology she's having there. So, so yeah, ended up revising her uh, to a TLF at four or five um, and um, using dual X. And so the next slide shows um, her uh, images. And so I thought uh, this was, uh, was again a unique case because as a T lift above an A lift that she had, but it really illustrates um, the power of dual X to see, you know, that the the once it's fully expanded, that 21 millimeters really does start to rival and become sort of a mini A lift uh, type cage. Uh, and you can see on the lateral too, you get really really great uh, vertical expansion to um, uh, at the with this implant as well. Um, and so she's now six to eight months out and is is doing well. I think the next slide shows her last, uh, yeah, her, her, her most recent follow-up images. So uh, those are just some cases uh, that I've had. Um, like I said, uh, some that show the power and size of the implant compared to an ALIF, others that show kind of your run of the mill, straightforward, you know, one level uh, TLIF at four or five and my most recent case from yesterday uh, as well. And so uh, I've really enjoyed using it. Uh, also uh, provide some of those tips and tricks about making sure you take an AP, the wide decompression um, and discectomy as well. Um, and again, thank you for having me, Andy. And thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you very much. I have a question. Um, Dr. Don Park asked, what factors would you feel would make you use another TLF cage rather than dual X? So the space collapse, great to spondy, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, the biggest thing for me is uh, sometimes with this space collapse, uh, it's some of that, and that's changed a little bit. Um, at the more familiar I've gotten with it, the, the more comfortable I, I, I am using it in more collapse spaces, but um, uh, seven to nine is the, is the smallest cage uh, from a T-lift standpoint as far as expansion. So I don't think I could safely get it to a nine. I think I'll over distract it, then, then I, I won't use a, a dual X in that situation. Thank you. I have another question. Any tips of people retracting nerves while placing the cage into the disc space under an 18 millimeter tube? That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, 18 stuff. And I, I would recommend first don't use an 18 because it's, it's the 
the visualization is is not you don't there is none with, with the with what you're trying to do dual x through an 18 i think um, i did it a couple of times um and that was just more stubbornness on my part to say well hey i'm not changing that the two millimeters doesn't make a difference from an incision standpoint so i would recommend at least using a 20. Uh, and then the other thing is you really um your um assistant has to understand uh, their mission, right? It's more of protecting the fecal sac and traversing nerve root, not necessarily retracting it, because you don't want them to toe in as you're you're trying to get the cage uh, towards midline. And the other thing I would say is that, you know, um, depending on where you make your annulotomy, you want to make sure that um, it's truly a, a T lift and not a pliff, right? You don't want to be too medial to where you do have to actually retract the fecal sac to get uh, the cage in, um, because then you know you might be retracting for a longer time and, and get some nerve injuries. So those are the two biggest things. I and I go over with my PA every time. She she knows to tell me, hey, if she feels like you know uh, instrumentation is hitting a retractor and she's having to toe in, we stop and I reposition because. Um, that that's where you can run into issues for sure. It's a great question. Yeah, great question. I have a, another question here. It's more for the company, but I think maybe describe it. it, it the person's asking, are we going to show the tools used for backfilling the expanded cage? How easy is that process? Um, Dr. Parker, we don't have pictures ready for it, but can you describe how you backfill? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And I should have added a picture, that's my fault. So, um, so there is a funnel um, that has um, kind of a, a nozzle or a lip that uh, clicks into the, like kind of slides and clicks into the back of the cage once it's expanded. So there's a channel for it on the top and the bottom of the cage. So uh, I have um, my uh, uh, scrub tech, we, we fill that with DBM putty soaked with bone marrow aspirate. And so then you can get I usually, I mean, I think it holds two and a half cc's per funnel. So easily get five to seven and a half cc's uh, backfilled into that once it's expanded. Um, so it's actually pretty easy. You can see those channels and you can kind of feel it tactically kind of click into that channel. And then you just can drop the plunger in and you can, uh, you know, add significant amount of, I, I use DBM putty soaked with the bone marrow aspirate. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I had another question asking what kind of bone graft you use. So I think you answered that already. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, I had a, a quick sort of an, more of an overview question. Uh, you are actually one of the earliest surgeons that reached out to us. I mean, you've been only around three years and uh, the power of social media. I still remember when you reached out to me personally on, on Instagram and, and one thing led to another. Um, how did your practice change, if at all, um, having gone from a, a traditional T-lift with a traditional T-lift cage, and now that you do use dual X for most of your T-lifts, how did, how did that, if at all, change your practice or how you, you know, you uh, approached your practice. Yeah, now I think the biggest thing is I'm probably slightly more biased to T lifts now. Um, you know, we there are some some really really great approach surgeons uh, where I live, uh, but it's hard to get them scheduled. And so, you know, you, you have a patient in your office and you're trying to schedule, and they say, well, hey, we could do this case in two months. Uh, I, for some, I'm in private practice. Um, that doesn't work. You know, there's there's a, there's nobody's going to sit around and wait for two months for you um if if there's other options and so i feel confident um with the with dual acts that i can get you know great correction a a, a great expansion a large footprint cage uh, with a t-lift and so uh, you know in certain situations it's mixed bondies at, at five one great two spondies you know at five one i'll still do an a-lift but you know it's it's really kind of biased me um more a little bit towards towards t-lifts because I, I know i can get a great height restoration and great implant in there. Great. Well, thank you very much. Great talk. Um, all right, so I think with that, we'll move on to the next talk with Dr. Daniel Park, and he will be uh, speaking on the dual expansion lateral. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Andy and uh, Amplify for inviting me to uh, join Don and Dr. Cuck. Uh, Dr. Kaku Barco um, on this um, symposium. And so my charge today is really discuss the lateral procedure. Um, Amplify, I think most people know Amplify as a T-lift uh, cage expanding company, but uh, they do have a lateral uh, cage that I think is novel in various regards. Um, 
um, we don't have to go through all this, but going through the lateral procedure, the more common procedure of the OLIF and the XLIF. Um, and I think there's a lot of benefits of going lateral. Um, one, most people don't go into a lateral position. They, they either had an A-LIF procedure, um, like the previous talk showed, or a posterior surgery. So going through the side um, will make surgery potentially easier in some situations um, as no one's been there before. Um, you know, compared to a lateral um, and, um, versus an anterior approach, there's less risk for vascular injury as we're not really retracting or mobilizing the vessels, especially at L4-5. Um, and um, like Dr. Barco talked about, you know, the access surgeon, if you're not in a, a very um, big ALIF environment, uh, you may have trouble getting a very good access surgeon, or if you're in a very big ALIF territory like in Texas, maybe it's hard to get them scheduled. Um, compared to um, an anterior approach, um, if you go laterally and you're not trying to do deformity correction, you don't need to release the ALL, so you still have inherent stability. Um, but some of the um, compared, the benefits compared to a posterior approach is you don't have to do the muscle stripping of the multifidus and the erector spinae if you're doing a open procedure. Um, Still, despite the expandable um, cages of the T-lift approach that we saw, I still think you can get a very big, a bigger cage and probably a better disc prep going laterally as you're looking straight into the disc. Um, and possibly a, another benefit is the advertisement as um, uh, lateral still um, not widely uh, adopted. Go to the next slide. But just like anything in life, there's no complication. So if we look at the complications that are associated uh, with the lateral approach, Andy, next slide. Um, so if we look at anterior to the psoas or the O lift uh, procedure, there are various complications um, that, are, that have been reported. If you look at um, this uh, review paper um, where they looked at 235 patients, their complication rate um, was still pretty high at 32%. Um, the complication include vascular injury as your, your corridor is right near the vessels um, and anterior to the psoas. Um, you can still have nerve injury um, because the general femoral nerve lies right on top of the psoas. And if you retract the psoas uh, for a long period of time, potentially that can cause a traction or pressure uh, injury to the nerve still. Um, we think of um, o OLIF or ATP to be uh, less nerve uh, potential damage, but there's still reported nerve injuries associated with that. Now you're also more anterior and the ureter is retroperitoneal. So there are reports of ureteral damage um, as well as abdominal cavity um, um, injury as again, you're much more anterior than the traditional lateral approach. In that review paper I was talking about, most of the complications were more minor such as subsidence that, um, you know, do you call it a complication? of the procedure, complication of technique, uh, whatnot, but um, there still were high levels of vascular and nerve injury associated with the ATP uh, approach. So if we look uh, towards the next slide for the um, lateral, um, true lateral uh, surgeries, um, this uh, systematic review paper out of Rush showed if when they looked at 6,800 6, patients, roughly 11,000 levels fused, the complications still uh, um, um, are still present. Wound complications, it's probably very similar to posterior, maybe a little bit less compared to open. Uh, medical complications were, uh, were high, um, just like with any surgery um, uh, involving the spine. The vascular injury, um, this includes um, clotting, uh, thrombosis issues, as well as um, iatrogenic bleeding issues. That was less than 1%. GI issues, uh, this included nausea and vomiting, as well as perforations, that's roughly around 1.4%. And the dreaded complications, you know, the neurological issues that's received a lot of focus um, transiently um, um, were about in the mid 30s, but persistent um, neurological issues was about 4% at six months. Um, if we go to the next uh, slide. So again, this is the main fear. So um, um, I've been doing laterals, um, um, helping out um, one of my mentors, who was one of the pioneers in the lateral approach in Chicago. But we looked at all the cadavers and we actually put K wires in the ideal starting point um, in, in various cadavers. And 
there are some cases um, where that the nerve actually pier uh, the K wire pierced the nerve. So these are the issues that we worry about uh, when we're doing laterals, and that's the main fear that a majority of us have. Go to the next slide. So what are the causes for neurological injury? Like I showed in the previous uh, picture, that anatomical uh, pic, um, picture, the direct trauma, like piercing through a K wire or with your tools, that's very rare. Um, most of the time we believe that the mechanism for um, nerve damage is more indirect. Is it the retraction which produces a pressure ischemia to the nerve? That's the uh, prevailing hypothesis. So what can cause this indirect? Um, pressure injury to the nerve? Could it be the duration of the case, um, duration of the retraction? Um, so obviously, kind of like the ACDF, the longer you do the surgery, higher risk for dysphagia, et cetera. Maybe time is the most important value. The other possibility is the size of dissection. If you have a large retractor and you're dissecting everything and making a wide exposure on a lateral, um, that can potentially cause indirect trauma as you're um, making this incision bigger and bigger. So when we look at these factors, um, there was this one study, um, Mueller et al., uh, which found that time did not correlate to this. Um, they only looked at 26 patients, and when they classified people who had weakness less than three out of five and strength, it was 29 minutes in retractor time versus 27.5 minutes in normal. So the question is, how is that a clinically um, significant um, You know, when the difference in time was only a, about a minute and a half? Um, so they concluded longer time did not correlate. Um, however, if you look at other studies, if you go to the next slide, um, there are Uribe et al. found that it was a 32 minute uh, retractor time versus 22 minutes for those without. Bendersky found that there was no post-operative weakness. It was less than 20 minutes. And this other study, um, Pumberger found that duration of surgery did relate to hip flexion deficit. Um, so possibly time may not play a factor, but I think um, if you ask most um, people who do a lot of laterals, they try to keep their retractor time to 20 minutes and they feel that that, that is an important variable in terms of the indirect injury. So if you go to the um, next slide, the other factor that can cause indirect trauma is the size of incision. So the picture on the left is another company's retractor um, um, where it's a two bladed system. Those blades are 22 or 24 millimeters wide. So you can imagine if you have that retraction, maybe that's a very minimal amount of retraction since you're only expanding vertically and you're only working where you need to be versus the picture on the right where you have this three blade retractor with all the blades fanned out um, to get a good visualization. You can see how that can possibly cause more pressure around the psoas as you're retracting um, uh, the psoas out of the way. You go to the next slide. Um, if you look at um, in the market, there is a company that's coming that that has released a similar kind of concept in terms of size of incision, uh, where they had a traditional three blade retractor, kind of like that picture I showed you, where they're dissecting the psoas and getting that cage in versus their um, their uh, retractor system, where it's smaller and you can make a less um, traumatic exposure to the psoas, and they feel that that may play a huge role. So just like anything, if you go to the next slide, we don't really know, um, sorry, um, it, in regards to that previous company, you can see their advertisement where they have pre-op and post-op. You can see their cage. Um, they have metallic markers that sit on the apophysis and they have this bag of bones that uh, does its expansion for them. If you go to the next slide, uh, what I was alluding to is we don't know what's more important. Is it the duration or size? And probably the answer is probably a mixture of both. Um, you want to make the smallest incision as possible, as well as keep the times down as much as possible. Um, I don't think we have the answer yet on is the duration a little bit more significant or is the size more significant. And hopefully um, through studies that are about to start or are or, or beginning, uh, we'll be able to answer that question for our, our scientific uh, community. If you go to the next slide. Um, so the improvements to the market, um, as we saw in the other companies, um, uh, cage, um, you know, you have the the structural support of that cage sitting on the apophysis, but in, inside inside the disc space, um, there's really not much support besides just cancellous chips. So, could you potentially get a cage that has better support um, structurally uh, to prevent any subsidence? Um, and number two, you know, 
we're expanding horizontally, but are we able to expand vertically as well to help with sagittal alignment, height restoration, indirect decompression? So if you go to the next slide, um, I think um, Amplify kind of fits those two potential um, uh, modifications to what's out in the uh, science, um, the market at this point. And Andy, um, in his introduction, showed um, the lateral cage where it comes in various lordotic angles of 0, 7, 12, and now 18 degrees. And the lengths are the typical lengths that we see, um, range from 40 to 60 in length. And the most important thing is that you get height um, expansion um, anywhere from 7 to 17, and as well as width expansion 13 to 22. So you can go in as small of an incision as 13 and still get the footprint of the, the, tr the traditional 22 millimeter lateral cage or the OLIF gauge. If you go to the next uh, slide, so how do you incorporate this uh, technique? Um, so what I use, um, you can use any retractor you're comfortable with. Um, is it the two blade, three blade? There's really no, um, there's no benefit um, one or the other. This talk is not to say this retractor is better than your retractor, et cetera, but whatever you're comfortable with, I would use. Um, I've adapted um, to using the Stryker Niagara blades uh, because their, fi their um, blades are carbon fiber. So you don't see the metal um, when you're getting your x-ray. So that helps me in the visualization as um, our talks have shown that because it's expanding in both planes, x-ray is kind of important before you buy the final product to make sure that you're within the confines of the disc and you're not getting subsidence. For me, I still use a posterior blade um, that's metallic, so I kind of know my backstop. So as long as I know I'm not more posterior to that, I should be safe and not um, getting into any trouble with the nerve elements. Um, but the rest of the blades, I use uh, carbon fiber so I can see the end plates and I can see the expansion um, as best as I can. Go to the next slide. Um, so what are some changes though you have to do in your technique? Since you're making a 13 millimeter or as close to 13 millimeter annulotomy compared to the 22 millimeter annulotomy that we're used to making, they have an expandable cob that goes in, that goes in and it opens up to a 22 because you can't um, place a 22 millimeter cage through the, the disc space if you don't have that annular defect. So um, this cob goes in 13 and you can expand it and it and it opens up that space to a 22 and then you want to blow uh, through the disc as well as open up a 22 millimeter uh, defect contralaterally so the cage is not pigeonholed and it's not going to squirt out like a watermelon seed ipsilaterally. Um, if you go to the next slide also when you do the trials, they're going to they also have trials that go in 13 millimeter width and it expands so you want to expand the cage at the introitus of the, the, um, the disc, as well as the exiting part, so you, the final product can um, lay without having the resistance forces of the annular ring. Um, if you go to the next slide, so here's a good uh, case example. This is um, um, you know, one of the ideal cases that you probably would do if you want to start uh, doing this um, is an L34, um, you know, typical x uh, territory, you know, three, four, four, five. Um, this guy, um, he is a 60 year old male. He had a three, four fusion for stenosis and spondylolisthesis. His leg pain improved, but his back pain and left thigh started returning after seven months. His CT showed a non-union and, um, I'm not in Texas, but Michigan, the patients are fairly big as well. And, uh, their, his BMI was 45. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, here's his preoperative, uh, images. You can see on the lateral, the screws are in good position. Um, on the CT scan uh, coronal view, you can see the lucencies around the L4 screws. Um, there was some attempt posterior laterally, but just incomplete healing uh, of that. And here you can see how big this gentleman is. If you go to the next slide, um, so intraoperatively, here is the, the, the retractor that I use. Um, 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 this the it's tapered in terms of the um, the diameter of the uh, retractor. Um, proximally or closest to the skin, it's uh, 17 millimeters and distally uh, towards the disc space is 14. So I place that and I do one or two clicks to, um, to, get, uh, to get a little bit more visualization. So probably at the disc space, um, it's probably about a 16 uh, millimeter um, in diameter opening. Um, on, this, on the um, C-arm view, you can see I have that posterior metallic blade to kind of use as my backstop. So 
I know with that position, as long as the cage is anterior to that, I should be safe from the neural elements. You can see the benefit of the carbon fiber um, retractors. You can't really see, um, um, you can see the retractor, but you can still see the um, end plates as well as the disc. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, this is the, um, the trial on the left and you can see it, that circular, it's kind of within that um, retractor. As you expand it, um, you can see it expanding outside of the retractor diameter. So you can clearly see the expansion. Again, that posterior aspect of that cage is not posterior to my metallic blade. So I still know I'm pretty safe. Um, and then as a uh, final x-rays, um, lateral x-ray, if you go to the next slide, you can see a uh, good, good placement. Um, he has, um, he doesn't have any loss of lordosis because he was fixed posteriorly. But you can see that the width of this is similar to what you would do with a static uh, 22 millimeter cage. But again, we use the smaller um, incision. Timing for me is still, um, you know, still about 20 minutes for me. It, has, it doesn't really add that much time. Um, but I think I've made a smaller um, injury to a psoas to hopefully uh, minimize uh, um, um, an anterior thigh pain. And, and, and it, um, anecdotally, um, I, my patients do have less thigh pain, but, um, you know, I cannot quote you on a study. We're doing an ongoing project to see, um, the effects of size and duration on anterior thigh pain. But, uh, um, I think this has the benefit of getting your height as well as, um, horizontal expansion and trying to minimize the amount of trauma to the patient. Um, um, so um, that's it for my presentation and appreciate Andy letting me uh, come and talk to you about uh, the lateral expandable cages. Well, thank you. That was a great talk. Uh, to the attendees, if you have any questions, please uh, type it into the Q&A section um, and we'll read them out to you. Um, meanwhile, I, I had a question for you. Um, so I know you kind of alluded to it, but what sort of change in your technique, if at all, you have to employ uh, for this approach versus your so your static cage or tra traditional lateral approach? Um, so I think the thing that changed the most is I, I was originally a two-bladed retractor um, person. Um, um, I showed you what I was using before. And um, for me, I, I switched to a three-bladed retractor because it can kind of keep my um, smaller um, psoas uh, dissection a little bit more uh, smaller. Um, I feel like I can keep keep um, the retractor in place a little better in, in that small um, opening. With the two bladed, I felt like the the, um, the muscle crete was coming in and out when I was in, introducing uh, the in instruments. But it hasn't really changed my practice, Andy. I, I think um, we're able to do the same surgery through a smaller hole um, and. Um, the technique, um, you're really doing the same thing that that you're comfortable for all surgeons doing X lift. And I think that's the beauty of it. You're not really saying we need to learn this new technique. There's two added steps um, that um, you may need to do. It's the expandable cob and expandable trial. Um, and that doesn't really add much time to it. So um, if you if you're doing if you're someone who does a lateral in 20 minutes, I don't think it'll really add any more time to it um, uh, with the potential benefit. No, that's great. That was, a, that was a powerful statement. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have one question. Uh, um, Dr. John Choi, are you uh, Dr. John Choi from Australia uh, who signed on? Um, good morning. <laughs> Thanks for signing in. In a relatively tight disc space, do you find that expandable does not adequately expand the disc height as opposed to a static cage with sequential release the sizers? Um, so, you know, for me, um, when I do the disc prep, um, I'll, I'll, I'll sequentially release it. I don't use any, sh I don't use the shavers that much. I use the trials. And so I'll start off with the six or seven, whatever the smallest one, and I'll gradually start working it and I'll get the height there. Um, and preoperatively, I measure roughly the adjacent heights of, of the disc. So I know roughly I'm aiming for a 10 or a 12. And so knowing that, um, I don't think the, ex the expandable makes me feel like I undersized it or oversized it. I, I think it's really the preoperative planning. And I do a lot of my releases with the, with the sizers. I don't really, um, to get the height and see how loosey goosey it is. And then I'll put the final, tr uh, final implant in there. So I don't think it has really um, uh, changed in terms of you know, how happy I am with the height expansion. 
Um, and then I see your other question about um, the OLIF or the AT ATP. I'm not much an OLIF person, so I, I cannot speak to that. Um, I've just, I'm pretty much an XLIF uh, person, direct lateral. Um, so I do not have any tips for um, that, that uh, approach. Let me actually comment on, on that. Even in the previous uh, question, um, initially we, we, we actually thought about designing our expandable trials in vertical direction as well as lateral direction. And, and but we realized right away that uh, exactly what Dr. Choi has mentioned, it, 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 there's some limitation as, as to the collapsed spaces um, stretching the, the space more in a sequential way. So uh, it didn't really come across too well, um, but all of our expandable trials, they only expand in horizontal direction. So that way in a vertical fashion, we actually do it in a sequential fashion. So meaning you would, you would put in the, the shortest expandable trial and expand out horizontally. And once that happens, becomes like a, a static trial into this space, which allows it for that um, stretching and the, the sequential dilation uh, or sequential sort of um, upping, if you will, right? So that's, that'd be the, the major difference between sort of our trialing sequence as opposed to another similar expandable uh, lateral cage um, setup. And also OLIF, yeah, uh, Dr. Daniel uh, Park doesn't have any, but we do have other surgeons who've tried our cage in an OLIF and ATP setting. Uh, has some, some good anecdotal results from it. So love to kind of talk to you about it on, on a separate uh, forum, but thank you for your questions. Anything else? Um, uh, uh, I have another question. Does the striker retractor allow you to see the trial? on x-ray well? Uh, yeah, so because if you want to see as much as you want, you can have all the all the three blades um, carbon fiber and you'll be able to see the shadow of the uh, of the retractor and you'll see the expansion. There are tricks you have to do because the, um, the, the inserter is metallic. So you have to kind of do a Ferguson um, just to see around it. Um, but that's kind of why I like having that posterior blade metallic. So I, I know where the worst case scenario where I am posteriorly, but you do have to put a little Ferguson to it to kind of see around it um, to make sure that you're happy with it. Um, but it, it is it is visible um, and the striker retractor helps me the best in terms of seeing around it. Great. Great. Thank you very much. And thanks for all the, oh, we got one last question. Uh, do you recommend uh, cheating your starting point anterior or posterior due to the expandable nature of the cage good question um so you know for for me i still try to go kind of 50 yard line and i have i have not seen it at um you know move anterior posteriorly that significantly um but you know you're gonna it's it, it expands equally anterior posteriorly if anything it'll kind of cheat a little bit anterior because that's where it's fish mouth open um, so you may want to cheat a little bit posterior because you'll see it expand a little bit where it's it's freer. Um, but I, I would still go for um, um, the you know as close to the 50 yard line like uh, what they classically teach uh, through the nuvasive courses. But if you're going to cheat a little bit, cheat a little more posteriorly because the cage will move a little bit anterior because that's where it's a little bit more open because of the fish mouthing of the lordos. Yeah. Good point. Very good answer. Well, thank you very much uh, for all the questions. Um, and we'll move on to the final talk by Dr. Don Park on dual portal endoscopic spine surgery. Thank you very much, Andy and Amplify Surgical for uh, setting this all up and, and for my co-panelists uh, for uh, uh, giving such great talks. So uh, I'm Don Park, I'm at UCLA and um, I uh, will be talking about the dual portal endoscopic spine surgery. These are my disclosures. Um, so uh, minimally invasive spine surgery, um, if you're on this talk, then you're probably really interested in it. And uh, the evolution of it has gone uh, from larger incisions to smaller incisions. And we've gone from mini open expandable retractors to tubulars, like we've talked about with MIS TLIF and microscopes. And now we're in the realm of percutaneous and endoscopic. Um, and I would argue that in the US, we're pretty much stuck here in the tubular section with microscope, uh, whereas in, in Asia and outside of the US, um, you know, we're at the endoscopic uh, uh, aspect of things. And especially in Korea, where I think that they've really kind of, uh, uh, you know, advanced, you know, the uh, uh, endoscopic uh, techniques as well as in Europe and other parts of Asia. Uh, next slide. 
So uh, endoscopic spine surgery has evolved over time. Um, and the first generation of endoscopic surgery was uniportal, where uh, they were addressing uh, lumbar disc herniations, going through the foramen uh, outside in without any uh, bony resection. Then the second generation was going at L5-S1, an inner laminar uh, uh, approach um, to then get the disc herniations in that direction. And the third generation is both uniportal um, and biportal endoscopy or dual portal uh, for endoscopic laminotomy and decompression for stenosis. Um, and then uh, you have now the fourth generation where we're using both techniques to do lumbar antibody fusion. And that's uh, been documented in this uh, uh, excellent uh, textbook out of Korea. Next slide. And so uh, there's always a technology adoption life cycle. And with endoscopic spine surgery, um, there's also this uh, life cycle. Um, next. Uh, so there's uh, uh, the late, no, early majority is, uh, I think, uh, where the outside surgeons are from the U.S. And in the U.S., we're pretty much here. And we, we've got a long ways to go. We're still uh, catching up. But it's becoming more and more uh, 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 popular and, uh, you know, uh, and people are really looking into it. It's, uh, you know, AO has an online course uh, for endoscopic surgery um, and, you know, and people are, are seeking this out and we're looking at uh, uh, conferences, uh, you know, like NAS had a conference in 2019 that was combined with Neurospine um, and uh, we had Hyun Sung Kim come from Korea as well as uh, uh, Jeff Wong uh, who helped kind of set that up and it really did kind of open people's eyes about endoscopic spine surgery and then recently uh, April of 2022, uh, we've had endoscopic uh, debate on uh, will it become the standard for decompression. And so people are now starting to really kind of think about this as uh, uh, a true way of, uh, of, uh, of doing this kind of surgery. And the evidence is growing. Um, where we're getting more and more publications every year um, to the point where, uh, you know, is really, really uh, have a lot of evidence behind it. Next slide. So what are the concerns? And I'm going to tell you about my concerns uh, when I was trying to learn uh, both uniportal and, and uh, dual portal endoscopy. And the concerns were the learning curve for me. It's and why am I going to do this? Why am I going to make it harder for myself? Um, you know, I'm worried about, you know, is this a steep learning curve? You always hear that about uh, uh, uniportal uh, endoscopy. And I always thought, oh, you know, you have smaller things. You can have less uh, visualization. I can only see what's in front of me. Um, so why would I want to do that? Um, next you know, it's a longer surgery. Um, if you're, especially if you're in your learning curve and you're trying to figure this out, and you know, it's, if you're like kind of, uh, you have a flow and you have lots of cases to do, it's going to be really, you know, you know, uh, uh, a drag on your on your schedule. Next, uh, so the there's always risk of complications, especially during the learning curve. If you're just taking on something completely new, um, you know, why would I take that on? And then cost. You know, I think cost is a huge deal, especially. You know, in the COVID era where hospitals are really you know, losing money, you see, you know, these uh, Becker notices uh, every uh, uh, week now of this hospital losing hundreds of millions of dollars and that hospital losing hundreds of millions of dollars. And so, you know, they're really kind of looking into trying to reduce costs and how can we, uh, uh, you, know, con you know, contribute to that as surgeons. And I always thought, oh, well, there's no added benefit for, with the MIS techniques, you know, well, why do it? You know, is it truly just, you know, the size of the incision? Um, and is it something that uh, is beyond just the incisional size? Next. And could it be just cosmetic? And those are my concerns. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people are having the same kind of concerns as uh, if they're kind of contemplating and thinking about endoscopic spine surgery. Next. So I'll be talking about dual portal spinal endoscopy and, and dual portal is, uh, you know, where there's a separate endoscopic viewing portal as well as a working portal. So it really decouples the uh, endoscopic camera with the surgical instruments. And you can see here, uh, you know, th these are standard uh, arthroscopic equipment with uh, standard micro, uh, micro instruments. And so what that does is it helps lower costs. You know, like when I uh, go to my hospital and my ASCs and say, hey, I wanna start up this new technique. Uh, uh, you know, they're asking me, well, what do you need? Do you need, you know, a microscope? Do you need, you know, uh, uh, you know, a lot of spinal equipment? And if they don't have that already, if they're not already set up for spine surgery, then they're going to be like, well, you know, what's the ROI on all this, you know, and, and how many cases are you going to bring to us? And really, all I said was, I just need any of your arthroscopy equipments, which they already have. 
And then, you know, this is a striker uh, 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 arthroscope and a uh, arthrocare uh, radio frequency one. And uh, we, you know, uh, any you know basic spinal instruments uh, like Kerrison's, you know, Woodson's, uh, you know, Penfield's, things that we always use. And you can actually also use the dual portal endoscopic set that can help you really get all that, you know, into these ASCs quite easily. And we brought a lot of the uh, the uh, technology and equipment from Korea who have really popularized this. And there's some masters of endoscopic spine surgery there who've had thousands of, of cases and really developed a lot of this, uh, uh, a lot of this equipment to help do the surgery efficiently and well. And I think that, uh, you know, we're bringing that over, you can then take that to your ASC and do these surgeries so uh, uh, effectively uh, with, you know, pretty, uh, with still the added advantage of lower cost. So it's better flexibility, it's enhanced visualization and uh, increased versatility because of all of these things. And the way I look at it is, you know, really you're doing the same surgery with the same instruments. It's just, I'm just using something different to visualize what I need to see. So if, you know, I first started out doing spine surgery, you know, from fellowship, you know, I was using, uh, you know, loops and oh, expandable retractors. And, you know, then you move on to your tubes and your microscope. And, you know, that, that works extremely well. And, you know, I did that for 10 years and, and you know, had great results. And now you can just have the, the, the endoscope really just have that amazing uh, visualization that's so much better than a microscope. You can even zoom in to the little tiny capillaries of the dura and uh, be able to see little red cells kind of floating by. Um, and so th that, that's something that I think uh, really kind of opened my eyes when I first saw this uh, technique. And it's really easy to start with ASC, like I told you uh, before. Next. So it's the same equipment, it, it already exists. And all you have to do is say, okay, here's the list of things. This is my setup. You know, I have my scope, my radio frequency one, my bone cutting shaver, my tower, basics uh, instruments uh, like curettes, kerosens, pituitaries. Um, and, you know, and this is how I originally started, you know, doing it at UCLA, where I just took pieces of the metric set and I just said, I need these little things and that'll be my, uh, my mail stand. And so with all of this, I can do surgeries like lumbar disc herniations, uh, stenosis, spondylolisthesis, and I'll show you those cases. So a case like this with lumbar disc herniation, you know, it's extruded uh, disc herniation with uh, inferior migration. Uh, and so this is something that we can tackle easily um, with a dual portal interlaminar approach. So uh, at first we got to then expose the lamina. And so here I'm using the radio frequency one to then get the... Uh, uh, the lamina exposed and uh, and be able to identify the, the uh, bony landmarks. And then I'm going to do the laminotomy and you can use a high speed burge you know, with a diamond tip or, you know, or whatever tip you like to use. I like using a, uh, the diamond tip because it's less bone dust and also helps to, with less bleeding of the cancellous bone. Um, you can also use the, uh, uh, the shaver, but uh, with a this, this small laminotomy for a disc herniation, you know, I think uh, cost is a consideration for me too. So if I don't have to open a uh, uh, you know, bone cutting shaver tip, which is several hundred dollars, then you know, I can save cost that way and still be able to do what I need to do. So here I am exposing the, the ligamentum and uh, you know, being able to then uh, uh, release it so that it can then enter the canal. And so using just a standard curette, you know, I'm just kind of uh, 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 releasing the ligamentum. And this, these are the same steps that I did, you know, using tubes and microscopes. Again, it's just a different way of visualizing with uh, uh, endoscope instead of a microscope or a loops. And you can see here, the nerve root is tented over that disc herniation um, and the, the dura is more, is up at the top of the screen. And then, you know, I'm here and I'm doing this, I did my annulotomy and then I uh, am uh, fishing out the part of the disc herniation. And, uh, you know, I can visualize that nerve root and, and see that, uh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't uh, uh, have it in danger with my pituitary. And then, you know, I was able to grab that uh, uh, inferior extrusion um, uh, after retracting that nerve root with a, uh, uh, just a handheld uh, retractor. Next. So this is a study out of Korea where they've done, uh, you know, basically thousands of these cases. So they, this compared uh, dual portal uh, the discectomy versus microdiscectomy with at least one year follow up, and both groups did well. So no difference in terms of uh, back pain, leg pain um, outcomes, uh, as well as disability outcomes, um, you know, between the groups. Other than the bipodal group uh, had the uh, uh, improvement of back pain for a week after surgery. 
And so I think that that just tells you that this is even you know, less minimally invasive than the, uh, a microdiscectomy. Um, but at the same time, the leg pain was better uh, or it was the same and, and ODI scores were the same. So it's just as effective uh, for uh, the, uh, as compared to the, the microdiscectomy for disc herniations. And then in terms of complications, there were no complications with the, the dual portal group versus one case of infection for the microdiscectomy group. So pretty similar really, um, but pretty safe and effective. And that's the kind of take home message I got from, from this uh, paper. Next slide. So uh, you can also do lumbar stenosis, and, and you know you can do pinpoint severe lumbar stenosis uh, with this technique, and uh, be able to uh, really kind of decompress uh, widely and fully uh, with excellent results. Uh, next slide. And so here is a this is me doing my laminotomy. I'm, I'm um, I drilled uh, to uh, get the uh, ligamentum released. Now I'm using my uh, my bone cutting uh, shaver to go across to the other side, uh, and I'm shaving down and drilling down to the contralateral aspect of the canal. I'm going to expose both sides, as you see here, of the ligamentum flavum with the epidural fat in the middle. And then I've already resected my the ipsilateral ligamentum flavum, and now I just resected the uh, uh, contralateral. And you can see that you can see both sides of the dura are pretty free. So here, the this is the traversing nerve root of the contralateral side. This is the dorsal aspect of the canal uh, with great decompression of the dura, and that's the ipsilateral uh, 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 traversing nerve root. And so you can visualize everything, make sure that it's a widely decompressed um, uh, uh, by the time you're done with the surgery. And so uh, you want to take out big chunks like this. And, you know, and I recently came back from Korea and I just saw, you know, again, one of the masters of this uh, do this surgery. And he took out, you know, those two pieces in one piece, which I've never seen before. I never thought it was impossible. And he was able to do that. And so that was just amazing to me that you were able to just do that and, and so effectively and efficiently too. So you can see, even with this pinpoint stenosis with such, you know, very thickened ligamentum flavum, you can have, you know, significant improvement uh, of the stenosis. And this is like post-op day one uh, MRI. Um, and so, you know, as uh, some of that post-operative fluid uh, improves, then, you know, I'm sure that the stenosis or the, I mean, so the dura will uh, expand even further. Next slide. So this is an RCT out of uh, the Spine Journal, actually, uh, where they looked at micro decompression versus dual portal decompression and at least one year follow up. And they found no difference. Again, significant improvement in pain and disability scores for both groups as compared to before surgery. Next. And. Uh, you know, at all time points, there were no difference, and there was no difference in ODI scores as well. Next, uh, and then in terms of complications, there were no difference in complications. Uh, they had a seven percent dural tear rate. Epidural hematoma was three percent in both groups, micro and uh, endoscopic. They had one uh, uh, that required revision surgery uh, nine months after surgery with the microscopic group. So uh, pretty similar in terms of uh, uh, safety. So safe and effective for both uh, uh, discectomy as well as stenosis. Next slide. Now you can also do lumbar spondylolisthesis. And so this is a case of mine uh, with uh, you know, uh, grade one, L4-5 spondylolisthesis with severe stenosis. And you can see uh, with flexion extension uh, 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 x-rays that there's uh, uh, instability there. Um, and so, you know, this is like one of those classic cases, you know, you can, you can go whichever way you want to go. You can go T-lift, you can go lateral, you can do A-lift if you wanted to. Um, and so I elected to do uh, uh, endoscopic T-lift. Next slide. And so, you know, what I did was a classic unilateral laminotomy, bilateral decompression. And this video is showing me after I did the decompression, I'm doing the facetectomy with the osteotome. And I'm visualizing that uh, osteotome directly and seeing where it is so that it's not going to injure the dura. And then I, you know, I take away the uh, uh, facet, uh, 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 and I can use that as a uh, uh, bone graft, autograft. I expose Camden's triangle. I place the cage. And these are really just uh, the same steps as an MIS T-lift. And so, you know, for me, it's just visualizing it differently. Now, the one key difference is that I can then also drive my scope into the disk space and I can make sure that the, that the disk space is completely uh, uh, prepared, the end plates are prepared. And that's like the key for, uh, for fusion. You, want, you know, for successful fusion, especially with inner bodies, you gotta make sure that your prep is good. And so what I usually do is I'll put in my shaver 
and then I'll put the shaver in and then I'll do my uh, shaving and I'll do my pituitary work just like I would for any MIST lift. And then when I go in and do that, I realize there's so much more um, in terms of disc left. And so I can directly visualize, I can directly uh, uh, place uh, uh, you know, instruments to be able to remove the disc. Now here I am after the disc is prepared and I'm implanting uh, or I'm placing the, uh, uh, the dual uh, X uh, uh, cage. And you can see this is the, uh, the intraoperative endoscopic uh, uh, view. And I have special endoscopic sleds and retractors to help uh, retract the, the dura as well as help place that cage uh, 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 easily without any uh, dural injuries or uh, exiting nerve root injuries. And so then, uh, you know, like there's no real concern for an 18 millimeter tube or whatever tube. It doesn't matter because I can see with a seven millimeter incision uh, what I'm doing um, with uh, the uh, with the uh, 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 with the cage. And here I am expanding the cage. You know, and the expansion actually is quite easy. You just keep turning the knob until it's you know fully expanded. Here I'm, I'm placing the cage, the the locking screw. So I'm making sure that it's in line, that the insert is collinear, and then I'm placing the locking screw into the uh, into the cage uh, uh, one under direct visualization, um, and, and then you get a tactile feel for uh, the, that locking screw. Um, and then uh, you know this is the there's a question of how do you place the uh, the bone graft. So there's the cage, and you place these funnels, um, these cannulas that have tapered ends, and you place. Uh, these tapers like uh, at the uh, uh, the middle of the cage where there's a little small space and then you can then place your bone graft of choice. So I like using uh, uh, allograft uh, uh, DBM fiber and I'll uh, place that into the, uh, the disc space. I'll also pre-pack with the uh, uh, with the allograft or autograft sorry. I'll process the autograft from my facetectomy. I'll pre-pack into the disc space and I actually don't have to worry about oh am I you know going to Am I going to push that that cage more laterally because I visualize that the complete discectomy of that disc and I know that there's plenty of space and so I'll place a, a bone graft into the disc space uh, and then also post pack with the uh, uh, with the uh, allograft uh, DVM fiber. And so the, this is floral shots. This is when I'm first starting out with the uh, the case. I got my instruments in, and then after the unilateral monotomy, bilateral decompression, then I in the facetectomy, I'm then impacting the cage, and then uh, I place the cage directly into the most anterior portion of that disc space before you start expanding it. And then, uh, then I'll start ex expanding, and this will show this shows that uh, it's expanded medial to laterally. Um, uh, before that, you do want to make sure that you're you're across midline, that there's no um, uh, that that it's uh, uh, that the tip of the uh, uh, cage is nicely across that midline, so that you can get that perfect uh, placement of that cage right in the middle. And then uh, this is after full expansion, both medial and laterally, as well as in height. And you can see uh, that it's uh, it, you know it's a very wide uh, footprint uh, for more surface area, but also for uh, the uh, uh, the ability to just you know go from the anterior apotheosial ring um, and uh, uh, be able to cover as much of that end plate as possible, so that you get less of that risk of subsidence. And I think that's the key you know uh, benefit of this cage. When I first saw this cage, I was like, oh wow, this is really cool. And I used to, you know, you know I first did it with you know MIS. Uh, uh, you know, techniques. And then, uh, but I was like, oh, what about endoscopic? This will be really cool to do, but I didn't understand how to do it uh, until I, you know, learned this technique. And I was like, this cage would be perfect for uh, that, uh, uh, this dual X cage. So now this is the perfect marriage of the dual uh, portal endoscopic as well as the dual X cage. So these are final shots. So she was osteoporotic. So I put in uh, uh, fenestrated screws as well as uh, 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 bone cement. And uh, this is uh, uh, three month follow up x rays. And you see there's no subsidence uh, uh, of this uh, of this cage uh, thus far. So, you know, going to keep monitoring, keep following, but hopefully uh, it'll continue. Next slide. So this is another case of mine where it was. Can you go back? So it was pretty severe uh, collapse, and um, you know I, I kind of mixed techniques. So I actually placed a, a, a pedicle based retractor on the contralateral side, and I had my fellow do the facetectomy on the contralateral side as I worked, and I did the unilateral laminotomy uh, decompression on on my side on the on the ipsilateral left side, 
and then uh, then did my facetectomy. And once I got both facets released, then I placed my initial uh, 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 distractor into the disc space, and then held that distraction with the pedicle screw based uh, retractor. So next. And you can see that uh, after serial expansion, I was able to get it high enough where I can then place the cage um, and then, uh, you know, be able to expand the, the cage in the disc space. And so, uh, you know, with the serial distraction, with, you know, kind of locking that distraction, um, it really helped to uh, kind of help uh, get this cage in there. So, you know, just kind of mixing techniques, uh, uh, MIS on the contralateral side, endoscopic on the ipsilateral side to be able to accomplish the goals of surgery. Next. So here it is uh, pre-op versus post-op, and then they're able to, you know, get better lordosis uh, and uh, uh, be able to uh, accomplish the goal of surgery. Next. So this uh, study out of the spine drill, as well as many others, uh, there are several others that have been published thus far for MIS T-lift comparing with uh, dual portal uh, T-lift with at least one year follow-up. They show all the same thing, and it's a pretty common theme. Next. And the next, and the next. So the VAS scores and the ODI scores are similar, uh, you know, with both groups. They're both improved as compared to pre-op versus post-op. Next. And, you know, back pain did show uh, more back pain uh, with MIS, TLF versus uh, dual portal, which makes sense because it's more minimally invasive, but no difference between the groups. Next. And no difference in fusion rates, like mental height or doses. And so, you know, it shows that it's just safe and effective. This is a recent case of mine that I did uh, for a pretty large synovial facet cyst. And I was pretty worried about this one because, you know, just uh, dural adhesions and getting a dural tear. And, and But, uh, you know, I was able to really kind of uh, you know, slowly peel it off using the hydro dissection, using the water pressure to kind of help uh, kind of uh, uh, get some of that, uh, uh, that dissection going uh, uh, to remove that cyst off the dura. And this is a, a video showing the, the de complete decompression after a resection. Next. I think the biggest uh, advantage for me, especially uh, uh, you know in the U.S. compared to Korea, is morbid obesity. Uh, you know, when I learned it, I learned the techniques just for uh, you know you know Korean patients who I think are quite thin uh, versus U.S. patients. I, I had a pretty rough uh, awake, you know awakening when I uh, started doing this these uh, surgeries because my patients were bigger. And I, you know, if you don't get your incisions planned right, then you're gonna end up crossing your, uh, your, your, your uh, instruments because uh, you, you're, you're not triangulating correctly. Um, but if you can overcome that, you can figure out how to uh, place your portals. This surgery is basically the same as doing it for thin patients. You know, it's just, you know, you're just hubbing the, the scope all the way down. Uh, and, you know, you're really kind of, you know, kind of getting all of that uh, soft tissue going through all that soft tissue, but with the same uh, size incisions. So that could help re potentially reduce infection, wound healing risk. Um, and uh, uh, be able to then accomplish surgery. So, you know, I used to do these with long uh, uh, tubular retractors, like 100 millimeter retractors. And it's really difficult to do anything at the distal end of that too. And then you got to wand it all the time. And, you know, it was such a difficult thing. And then with this, as with good planning, it's, it, it felt like doing surgery for a thin patient. You just have to have, uh, uh, you know, your, 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 your surgery planned out correctly. And so no need for large incisions. Uh, this is a study that I'm uh, hopefully gonna be publishing soon. Um, it's a systematic review and meta-analysis of all of the papers uh, uh, in uh, dual portal and uh, uh, spinal in, uh, uh, endoscopy. So we looked at uh, discectomies, decompressions, T-lifts, and we found the 42 papers over 3,700 cases of uh, mean follow-up over a year, 2,400 decompressions, over 1,000 discectomies, 261 TLIFs. And we found 290 total complications for a rate of 7.8%. In terms of durotomies, it was 2%, uh, 2.2%. Uh, incomplete decompressions, 1.3%. Uh, epidural hematoma was the highest at 3.79%. Uh, genetic instability is quite low, less than 1%, uh, as well as transient nerve root injuries and infections, only three out of the, you know, 3,700 cases. So, you know, 0.08%. Uh, 
Uh, and the highest rates of durotomy and epidural hematoma were the TLF cases, um, and then uh, uh, the incomplete decompressions for, of course, the, the decompression. So you just got to make sure that you uh, get the, uh, the, the technique down before you actually get these uh, cases going. But very effective and significant improvement in outcome scores with all of these cases um, that are similar to uh, the, uh, the comparisons, which is traditional MIS techniques. So are the concerns that I had legit, you know, uh, no, I don't think so. The, one, the learning curve is shallower, I think, for biportal than uniportal, having learned both. I think that learning the learning curve is real, but, you know, I would say about 20 to 25 cases, I feel like it, you'd be kind of near on the on the top end of that learning curve. And then, uh, you know, I think, you know, why, why not make it easier for myself, actually? The visualization is even better. This is a video that I took uh, in one of my cases where I, I'm just I just drove my camera right up to the uh, dura, and unfortunately it didn't translate well in in the PowerPoint, but you know it was 4K, and so I was able to visualize that those red cells flowing through the capillaries of the dura, and so uh, 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 you know the visualization is amazing, uh, and it's similar in terms of duration of surgery, and, and actually for me. Uh, discectomies and decompressions is faster for me now than uh, it was even with tubes. And so I'm able to do things faster now. And so, uh, and then risk of complications, you know, I think that it's even better with your visualization. If it's better, I think that the complications are lower. Um, and so, you know, for me, I, I, I take this hands down now in my practice in this, this technique over doing, going back to tubes. Uh, one time I was forced to do that where I actually had to you know, do tubes for my second case because they had to take the scope away for an ACL or something like that. And, you know, I, you know, I was decompressing the contralateral side and, you know, the, the dura is ballooned up and, you know, I, I was trying to get to the lateral recess and I got a dural tear. You know, it was like a small one, two millimeter dural tear. It's easy to fix. But, you know, I, I bet you if I had it with endoscopic, I wouldn't have to have to deal with that. So I do think that the visualization is even better and, and that help, makes it safer. Um, in terms of cost, you know, again, lower cost ASC, and it's the uh, thing that uh, uh, really kind of impressed me. Next. And I think in terms of uh, uh, the results are similar, it's, it's safe, it's effective. Um, and, you know, I think that a lot of people made these arguments, you know, before. I remember when I was training in residency, uh, that, you know, MIS was kind of controversial and, you know, uh, people were like, oh, well, you know, why do it? And you had the same results. And so, um, you know, now I think the argument is made again for MIS uh, with the uh, tubular uh, techniques or expandable techniques with endoscopic. And I think this is like, why not do it? You know, I think that uh, the people are looking for this, patients are looking for this. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it could be just as effective and, and maybe even safer. And so I, I, I argue why not, but we do need to do uh, a lot of research on this. So we need well-designed multi-center studies uh, to uh, really investigate this further. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have two questions uh, for Dr. Park. Uh, if you wanna, I'll, I'll start it off. Dr. Burke uh, asked, how central are you replacing your TILA? Or are you retracting the fecal sac? So yeah, I'm I'm retracting the fecal sac only to the point where you know um, I'm able to get that cage in, and it's not much retraction at all. And so you know that that uh, it's just to protect the, the fecal sac really. Um, and so uh, you know I think that with, as long as you're able to get the uh, facet off and you're able to create more space um, laterally, um, you don't have to retract much at all. And so I think uh, that's been instrumental. I, I remember in MIS techniques, I've had to do a lot of that, um, but not so much for this um, uh, technique. In terms of drains, yeah, I, I place drains on every patient because uh, you know I am, uh, you know, that's the one concern of mine is epidural hematoma. I've had one so far and, and over 80 cases. And so it's just, you know, this is one thing that, uh, 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 you know, just kind of worries me. So I place drains on everybody. But, you know, uh, for discectomies at the ASC, you know, after, you know, they are ready to, you know, to get up and walk around, go home, then I pull the drain. And then um, I, uh, for like uh, decompressions, the same. It, for T-lifts, I'll, you know, usually keep them overnight and then uh, take them out uh, the, the next day. 
And I do, uh, 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 you know, uh, want to make sure that there's, uh, you know, this is uh, that there's as much as minimal risk of epidural hematoma as possible, because what ends up happening, especially for telus and decompressions, when you take a lot of that bone, the cancellous bone, you know, is being tamponaded by the hydrostatic pressure, and so you know your visualization is amazing, and then you turn off the water, you take your scope out all that bone will start bleeding. So I'll do things like taking bone wax and, and really kind of shoving it up into the bone. I'll burn the, the cancellous bone with my reader frequency one to get the hemostasis. I'll even give TXA, I'll, you know, during the case, I'll place the drain. I'm doing everything I can to just reduce that risk as much as possible. Um, so, and then uh, learning curve. How is the learning curve for your system holding the scope? Yes, I don't think it's much of a, of a, of a uh, difficulty if you have experience with, uh, you know, uh, endoscopy or even arthroscopy. Um, you know, I think a lot of the orthopedic trained people will, you know, be able to like, oh, like this is familiar. Um, you know, it's just translated into the uh, into the spine. Um, and so yeah, there is a learning curve. I think it's not holding the scope. The learning curve is starting the case is making your portals. It's you know preparing the soft tissue or preparing the 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 working space with you know you're making you're trying I try to make a bubble of water and you're trying to create that bubble and if you don't make that well then you're going to be in soft tissue you have no idea where you are you're going to be flailing kind of you know be difficult to see. Um, so that's the biggest part of the learning curve just getting started. Once you do it looks like every other spine surgery. You know, it looks like you're, you know, like tube surgery or open surgery. The pathology is familiar. And that's where I think people kind of pick this up quickly. Um, in terms of dural tear, uh, so it depends on how big it is. So if it's a small, tiny little dural tear, then I'll put in like a gel foam or, or a Duragen or some, something to put into, to stuff it into the, the tear, then turn off the water, remove as much water as I can, and then place to seal over the, uh, uh, the, 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 the tear. And, um, uh, you know, and everything kind of folds over, you know, you know, whenever you do tubular cases, I remember if I had a dural tear, I did the same thing. And, you know, you know, maybe, I, you know, bed rest for a couple hours, and then they're usually asymptomatic with a pretty low risk of pseudo Um, you know, that's just my experience in it. But, I think similar, that there's nowhere for the CSF really to go because this, this, you know, you're not really creating a lot of dead space in there. Um, for multi-level pathologies, yeah, so I do it for you know, two, three level uh, cases. It just, you just kind of plan appropriately for those incisions. And then um, if, uh, uh, if I do more than three, then it becomes like a long time. And then if in congenital stenosis as well, if you're doing like, L2 to S1 and it's, there's congenital stenosis and like, you know, I'd rather just do, you know, more traditional techniques than, than, than the scope. It just take too long, I think. Um, and so for efficiency sake, you know, I'd rather just, uh, you know, leave it to, you know, two, three level cases. And then, uh, yes, L5 S1, you know, it, it, it is, you do have to plan appropriately for that. You know, you do have to shift your incisions more distally uh, toward the foot. And uh, I put in a lot of reverse Trendelenburg to try to change some of the, uh, the angulation so that it's not so difficult. And then I, you know, uh, uh, I think that helps a lot, but, uh, you know, sometimes if it's really high, you know, you're just going to be working kind of sideways uh, a little bit. It's not that you're, you're, you're tilted, it's just that your hands will be like this, um, but your, your body will actually be, uh, your head and neck is going to be nice and, and level because you're just looking at the monitor. Um, but your hands are going to be working a little differently. So that's, that's take getting used to. Um, but, you know, you can save your neck. I mean, uh, you don't have to be like this with the microscope or uh, you don't have to tilt the table where you try to get to the other side. You don't have to like wand anything. So it really does make things a lot easier um, in, terms of, uh, uh, in terms of doing the surgeries, I think. All right. Well, thank you very much. That was a, uh, that was, that was a wonderful Q&A session. Um, thank you to uh, all of our faculty for, uh, uh, for the wonderful talks. I do want to direct all of our attendees' attention to this Cadaver Workshop Fall Symposium coming up uh, in actually a few weeks, uh, about a, a month from now. Um, if, if there were any more questions or if anybody wants hands-on experience or hands-on uh, practice on any of the topics that was discussed tonight, uh, this is the place to be. So it'll be in the New York area. Uh, New York, it's about 15 miles away from the New York City. Uh, we'll have um, our current faculty along with a few additional ones, especially we're inviting two of the dual portal masters from Korea as well. So we'll have 
uh, didactic and, and actual cadaver work uh, stations covering from MIST to lateral and uh, dual portal uh, all together. So please uh, sign up for that. Uh, spaces are very, very limited. Uh, we do have some spaces left over. So, uh, so please sign up for that uh, at amplifysearchable.com. If you go to the, the website, there is a registration button right in the front uh, area of our website. Um, if, that, if this opportunity is not the right opportunity for, for you uh, among the attendees, we do offer other training um, options as well, uh, locally, regionally, and tailored as well. So uh, if you're interested in learning more about anything at all, uh, whether it's training, workshops, or any other uh, regional opportunities, please email us or contact us through AmplifySurgical.com. So with that, um, thank you again. Uh, it's exactly an hour and a half, so the timing worked out beautifully. Um, so have a good good night, and to all the all of our international attendees, thank you for attending as well. Good night.